Broadcasting from the Hair Saloon corporate offices, it's the Suzanne Benker Show, where men and women are equal in value but wildly different by nature. Join us here every week when we challenge the culture's hugely flawed narratives regarding men, women, sex, and love. Today on the show, we're going to talk with Heather McDonald about America's cancel culture, which has risen to new heights in the wake of George Floyd's arrest and subsequent death. But first, a couple of quick announcements. Please consider sharing the Suzanne Benker podcast with a friend or a family member you think would enjoy it. Shoot them a text or an email with a link to a specific episode you enjoyed. Word of mouth is the primary way podcasts grow. I also want to remind you that if you're looking for marriage or relationship coaching, go to SuzanneVenker.com and click on the coaching button at the top. Finally, if you love the Suzanne Benker show and you would like to see it remain commercial free, don't forget to become a Patreon subscriber. Just go to the SuzanneBankerShow.com and click on become a patron. So I wanted to pause from my normal podcast topics to do this special episode on what's happening in this country with respect to America's cancel culture, where Americans who don't kowtow to identity politics or who don't think the way they're supposed to think are forced to apologize or even resign for making perfectly reasonable and truthful statements. Earlier this month, Stan Wichnowski, editor at the Philadelphia Inquirer, was forced to apologize and ultimately resign after using the headline, Buildings Matter Too. He later characterized his own work as, quote, deeply offensive. Over at the New York Times, editorial page editor James Bennett resigned after a staff uproar as a result of U.S. Senator Republican Tom Cotton's statement in an op-ed that military troops should be sent to restore public order in American cities when the police are overwhelmed. Anna Wintour, editor of Vogue, apologized for the mistakes, oversights, and supposed offenses her publication has committed during her tenure. And Tucker Carlson lost advertisers for pointing out that Black Lives Matter is not about black lives, but about something else altogether. And it isn't just journalists who are marginalized as a result of their speech. The author J.K. Rowling's made what was referred to as a controversial statement in pointing out that women, and not men, get periods. Fortunately, Rowlings didn't apologize or take back this obvious fact of life. Here to talk with me about America's cancel culture, as well as the myth of systemic police racism, is City Journal's contributing editor, Heather McDonald, who's also the author of The War on Cops. Welcome back to the show, Heather. It's so nice to talk with you again. Thank you so much, Suzanne. I'm I'm honored to be with you. So I want to start by just sort of defining for people what cancel culture is. And what I wrote down here is as follows. I said, and you can correct me if I'm wrong or if I'm missing anything, the censorship of any media or business that doesn't conform to a specific set of extreme left-wing ideologies. It's the idea that Americans essentially need safe spaces for mean words because they might trigger a microaggression. Would you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. I think in the public sphere now, uh, the range of opinion that is acceptable uh, for expression is growing narrower and narrower. And we're living under a right now in the wake of the uh, resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement. The dominant narrative is that America is defined by white supremacy and racism. And anybody who dares to challenge that or is insufficient in expressing enthusiasm for that proposition is literally at risk of his job. So we have brands and products who are pulling their, what do you call it, the emblem for the product, like Aunt Jemima, Uncle Ben Rice, Mrs. Butterworth, Cream of Wheat. There's just a whole slew, you know, a domino effect of people who want to remove from their products anything that, how would you say, smacks of something that could make, somebody feel that this is racist in some way. And we have as well gone with the wind being pulled from HBO. And these are all sort of products of what we're talking about. In addition, of course, we're finding this removal of statues across America. And so these are all examples of what you're talking about. And it's this extreme reaction that's completely emotional rather than logical, because the mob has sort of taken over. And uh, Jordan Peterson wrote a blog post last week that I, and I'm going to read a quote from there, that I think kind of gets to this larger issue really well. He wrote, the George Floyd incident has emboldened those 
who are shamelessly using crooked faux moral means to stake a moral claim in the so-called patriarchal structure that makes up the academic world. He's specifically talking about the academic world, but of course this is also in the culture at large. They are willing to use the unfortunate death of an individual who had enough of the attributes of a systemically oppressed person to serve as a poster boy for the self-serving political claims that are now being made on his behalf. So as an example, um, I have the op-ed that Senator Tom Cotton wrote uh, where he takes on the woke mob. And I had mentioned earlier in the intro that James Bennett of the New York Times had resigned after the staff uproar over Senator Cotton's statement in an op-ed. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I'm just going to read real quickly from there, and then I want to get to your article. Um, he's essentially writing about cancel culture, right? And he says, we hear that in the news a lot these days. And we saw an instance of it just last week at the New York Times. He published an op-ed there that said simply that while we respect peaceful protesters, we can have zero tolerance for looting and rioting. And if the police are overwhelmed or outnumbered, that the National Guard will have to restore order. And just as a result of having published that, the New York Times fired the editorial page editor and reassigned the deputy page editor, who then apologized, prostrating himself in front of the woke child mob and said we will do much better um so that's sort of like the larger you know the cancel culture is sort of the larger issue that has um is sort of dominating the news right now but you wrote this awesome piece in the journal a couple weeks ago called the myth of systemic police racism and the gist of your article there was essentially, yeah, we need to hold officers accountable who use excessive force. But then you laid out that there is no evidence of widespread racial bias. And you wrote, quote, this charge of systemic police bias was wrong during the Obama years, and it remains so today. However, sickening the video of Floyd's arrest, it is not representative of the 375 million annual contracts that police officers have with civilians. A solid body of evidence finds no structural bias in the criminal justice system with regard to arrests, prosecution, or sentencing. And then you said crime and suspect behavior, not race, determine most police actions. Can you explain that a little bit? Well, yes, Suzanne. The big issue that nobody wants to talk about in discussing policing is crime. And and that's absurd. Uh, Policing is a function of crime. It is an epiphenomenon of crime. And to not notice the fact that police are in minority neighborhoods because that's where people are being disproportionately victimized is to present a completely false picture of the police. Blacks between the ages of of 14 and 34 die at 13 times the rate, one, three times the rate of whites of those ages. Why? They're not being killed by the police. They're not being killed by whites. They're being killed by other blacks. Blacks commit homicide at about 11 times the rate of whites. Uh, And if you put policing next to rates of criminal offending, any disparities simply disappear. Uh, the the original claim of the Black Lives Matter movement was in twenty that was first invigorated in twenty fifteen and twenty sixteen was that we were living through an epidemic of racist police shootings of black men. Again, the 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 data, if you look at this systemically, and nobody is nobody in the country is justifying the George Floyd arrest, but that is aberrant. And I can t- talk later about a nearly parallel uh, lethal arrest of a white man in Dallas in 2016 that got zero Zero public attention because it didn't fit the narrative. But if if you look at the numbers overall, the police shoot about a thousand people fatally a year. The vast majority of those thousand victims are armed and dangerous. Blacks make up about 23% of of that 1,000. That is more than the black population. Most certainly blacks are about 13% of the population. But that's the improper benchmark for comparing police activity because 
police don't decide where to go based on race or population figures. They go based on crime reports, victim calls for assistance, and community requests for help. And that is in minority neighborhoods because of that small portion of the black community that is committing almost the entirety of violent street crime today. Blacks nationally commit over half of all homicides, about two thirds of robberies. If you look at given any given city like Chicago, blacks and whites are each a little under a third of the city's population. Blacks commit 80%, 80% of all homicides and shootings. Whites, less than 1% of all homicides and shootings. A black Chicagoan is 50 times, five zero times, more likely to commit a shooting than a white Chicagoan. These are not facts that the cops wish for. It is a reality forced upon them by the reality of crime. And they cannot go to where people are victimized without producing racially disparate uh, police activity. And shootings are predicted over, police shootings are predicted overwhelmingly by the rate at which officers encounter armed, violent, and resisting suspects. And given the vast overrepresentation of blacks among violent street criminals, there is going to be some overrepresentation of blacks among people that the cops shoot. But that disparity is much smaller than the disparity, say, of people who shoot the police. Blacks are, black males are 6% of the nation's population. They've made up about 42% of all cop killers over a decade, making them about 18 times more likely to kill a cop than a than an unarmed black male is. Uh, so a police officer is 18 times more likely to be killed by a black male than an unarmed black male is to be killed by a cop. So our narrative has it just backwards. And I'm I'm certain that you know about this, but I don't know if my listeners do. So I'm going to play Major Travis Yates. He writes this letter to the Tulsa mayor about exactly what we're talking about. And here he is behind the scenes, seeing the truth, everything you just laid out. And he's a cop and he's dealing with this every day. And he's listening to this narrative. And he finally sort of explodes, if you will, and, and writes this op ed. I'm going to read from in a minute, but I have a little clip here real quick um, of him talking on Tucker Carlson. I could be the most hated police officer in America right now, all yep. because I have the audacity to talk about that I did not believe there was systematic racism in policing. I, I have the data to show it. And what happened was because that narrative was completely against what other narratives are, uh, they twisted what I said and said that I think we should kill more black people. It's just outrageous. Oh, it's it's so absolutely fast. outrageous. And they have, and you know, they destroyed me and my family. So uh, the risks are so extreme. It's, it's very much a struggle. Uh, but I pray that, uh, you know, the profession can come back. We came back once before, but this almost seems like too much. So he writes that he spent the last two decades following the facts and data as it pertains to the issue of disproportional policing. He has trained law enforcement in 46 states and three countries, and he's been a Tulsa police officer for 25 years. And he said all of this that's going on right now with respect to what you were talking about, Heather, is an attack on you, meaning the Americans. It's an attack on our profession, and it's done to sway public opinion against you. Without context, it's dangerous and it's divisive. And he goes on. There's a lot more there. But he's essentially saying that it's not the fault of our officers that – um, that the facts are what they are, even if they're inconvenient or uncomfortable, right? And so he lists that all in in his um, in his letter to the mayor. But the the really scary part of all this, Heather, and I'm sure you know this, especially in the last few weeks, cops are now leaving law enforcement over what's going on. Well, yes, rec recruiting already uh, came to a, almost a dead halt in the first iteration of the Black Lives Matter movement in 2015 and 2016, when you had uh, hate being directed at officers and you had President Obama embracing the narrative that it is uh, 
appropriate for every black parent to feel that every time his child steps outdoors, he may be killed by a cop. He, President Obama actually said that during the memorial service for five Dallas police officers who were assassinated in July of 2016 by somebody inspired by the Black Lives Matter movement. So that first iteration already was driving people out of the profession, but it is going to be so much worse now because now you don't just have the White House on board with the Black Lives Matter narrative. You have entire the entire mainstream America, every single institution, every single corporation, every single law firm, every single bank, every single ice cream store, every single salad, takeout bar, uh, arts organizations, the New York City Ballet, the Metropolitan Opera, you name it. They have all put out statements decrying America's alleged racism and, and singling out the police as the worst offenders. It is something that no other profession lives under. It, it, this charge is based on, there's, there's no way to defend yourself against it. It's also a, a mysterious narrative because it's never been explained how this racism gets infused into the police profession. Are they claiming that the people who go into policing self-select and that they're racist to begin with? Anybody who spent any time in a police academy can immediately rebut that. Uh, the, the young people there are motivated by public service. They want to help people. They believe that all people should have an equal right to be free from fear. Uh, is it taught in the academy, the systemic racism? Again, I defy anybody to find me one class that would come even close to sending out that message. In fact, Officers waste far too much time with classes on systemic bias and multiculturalism instead of doing what they really need, which is more tactical training, practical experience, and de-escalation. So if it doesn't happen in the academy, does it happen on the job? Well, you know, I've spent time in precinct houses, and they are actually some of the most uplifting places to be in because of the lack of, of any kind of bias or skin color making a difference. You have black cops and white cops and Hispanic cops united in the, in the common sense that we need to protect the good people of the community. Uh, so this is a, a very bizarre narrative, but it is one that is so uh, dismaying to cops and it is resulting as it did in 2015 and 2016, but worse in Extraordinary levels of resistance and violence directed at cops on the street. We're going to see more cop assassinations, I'm afraid. And recruiting, yes, it's it's going to be impossible. Every every cop I know is is looking to get out and is telling anybody that might think of going into the profession of saying no, don't don't even think about it. I mean, talk about scary, right? And I want to get to what the what the real cause of of what's going on with this violence, which you and I, you especially have have talked about extensively. But when, I'll do that in a minute. First, I just want to point out that Colorado is the first state to have this police reform bill. And since this has all happened and I have this in front of me and it talks about, you know, now every officer in the state's going to have body worn cameras by July of 2023. Uh, use of force chokeholds are will be banned. Um, any officer who fails to stop another from using excessive force. So there's a whole list of things here for modifications going forward. But here's the scary thing that really that really struck me was that people have qualified immunity because this bill, and I don't know if this will happen throughout the rest of the country, but in Colorado, it removes the immunity defense, allowing people to bring civil rights claims in Colorado court. So they can allege civil rights violations and sue officers determined not to have acted in good faith or with a reasonable belief that what they did was legal can be held personally liable for a settlement of $25,000, which to me is, 
first of all, and I heard somebody calling in on, on the Dave Ramsey show the other day. He gets a lot of call-ins, and this cop was like, I'm leaving over this because I only make, what, $36,000 a year. That would just take me out, right? And that yeah. there's so much wiggle room with that. That's a whole different ball game than just not allowing chokeholds or whatever. Absolutely. And there's already a massive anti-cop bar that specializes in bringing lawsuits against cities uh, based on often phony claims of, of police abuse. It's sort of a cottage industry for a lot of drug dealers. You just automatically file a civilian complaint against your arresting officer, which is why the fact that any given officer has, whenever there's a, a controversial incident, if that officer has civilian complaints against him, that is taken as prima facie evidence of an abusive cop. It may be, but it may not be. Mm -hmm. It may just be evidence of an active cop because, again, that's what criminals do is they is they file retaliatory complaints. So there's already a bar that is is well placed to do this. And now that you can go after cops, not that they've got deep pockets. I mean, it's, it's actually, yeah, that's what I mean. You're right. better off going after the city because you can get $5 million as opposed to 25,000, but still, uh, yes, this is going to be the occasion for endless second guessing by people that have no idea what it takes to res uh, subdue a resisting suspect no idea what the threat is in making a car stop. Uh, you know, no idea about about what it is to try to make an arrest in the middle of a crowd of people who are screaming at you and throwing bottles and rocks. So this is uh, it's it's further on the road towards the coming anarchy because we are. I I talked in my book, The War on Cops, of what I called the Ferguson effect, which was the combined effect of depolicing of officers backing off of discretionary policing in high crime minority neighborhoods, having been told that they're racist for doing so. So it's completely understandable that if they're told that if they make a discretionary car stop, they're a racist, they'll do less of it. You know, policing yeah. is political. So when they do less of those stops, crime goes up. And we saw another 2000 black uh, males being killed in 2015 and 2016 compared to 2014. We're already seeing crime spike in New York City, Chicago, other places. We're going to see a crime spike now following these riots, following the the nationwide anti-cop campaign that is going to make 2015 and 2016 look like child's play. Well, what is your, I mean, what is your assessment of what's coming in the next six to 12 months? It's very bad, uh, very bad. Taking it outside of the public safety issue and the delegitimation of law enforcement, uh, I see more broadly the end of meritocracy because now the myth of bias, which is what is the only allowable explanation for any socioeconomic disparities, racial disparities, if, if you don't have, for ex instance, at a, in a chemistry lab, if the scientists working in that lab are not 13% black, which is the population of blacks in this country, uh, the only allowable explanation is, is that those chemists are discriminating against all of the qualified black chemists who have applied to the lab and they're not taking them even though they're qualified. Uh, or if you don't have 13% black partners in a white shoe New York law firm like Paul Weiss or, or, or Covington and Burling, the only allowable explanation is, is that that law firm is discriminating against all those competitively qualified black associates or black law school graduates. That is that is not the only allowable explanation or the only plausible explanation. It overlooks the fact that there is a massive academic skills gap. Your average black 12th grader reads at the level of your average white 8th grader. 40% uh, of black 8th graders are below basic in their reading and writing levels. That is basic being the lowest possible category on the National Assessment of Educational Progress. 
the SATs, there's a standard deviation of average score between blacks and whites, both on, on math and, and reading. All these things mean that they're simply are not the same. There's not the same pool of qualified applicants. Every institution in this country has spent the last two decades twisting itself into knots, trying to hire and promote as many plausibly qualified blacks as possible. Anybody who works in a corporation knows this. They've all been through diversity training. They know that they are rewarded for hiring and promoting blacks. It's not for lack of trying. It's because the pipeline does not contain it. Nevertheless, we are going to see more than even before the pressure on every single institution, on every newspaper, on every press room, on every TV station, every Hollywood studio, every publishing house, every academic department, every corporation, every bank to hire by race and, of course, sex, because the feminists are going to get in on the, on the picture instead of on merit. And the quality of our institutions is going to suffer because the only thing that should matter is somebody's professional qualifications, not the color of his skin. And just to um, close by, by covering what this is really about, um, Major Travis Yates, who wrote that letter, in the middle of his op-ed, he wrote, Frankly, I'm sickened that African Americans are victimized at such a higher rate. And then he goes and he gives the statistics that you basically have just given. But then he leads into the real reason for this. To those individuals that truly want a better Tulsa, because this is, was written to Tulsa community, I would ask that they place their efforts on real change. And then he pointed, of course, to the fact that 85% of all youth in prison today are from fatherless homes. 72% of everyone in prison for murder are from fatherless homes. 85% of rapists come from fatherless homes. And 71% of all high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. And fatherless homes have decimated African Americans at a significantly higher rate than any other race. That is the real conversation. You know, I mean, he knows this, of course, you know this, I know this. This is the topic that's never going to be addressed because it's all cloaked in this idea that we're a racist country, when in fact it's really fatherlessness that is causing the violence among these youth. Absolutely. I mean, that is the core of everything. It's not only the fact that growing up in a fatherless home uh, on an individual basis is leads those kids as much more likely to drop out of school, become involved in gangs and drugs, mentally ill, uh, criminal activity later on, becoming single mothers themselves. But another issue that is not often recognized, even by those of us who are absolutely calling from the hilltops to revalorize fathers, is that the marriage norm, if the community embraces the marriage norm, which is that the boys have an utter responsibility to take uh, responsibility for the children that they conceive, and that it is not acceptable to be serial uh, procreators and just go around and impregnate women and never take responsibility for those kids, the marriage norm civilizes males because they have to learn as children to restrain their impulses, to defer gratification in order to become marriageable mates, mm -hmm. to be acceptable. Mm -hmm. if, if they're freed from that expectation, if it becomes normal for single mothers to get pregnant and serially, I mean, there, mm -hmm. you have something called multi-partner fertility that is the sociological term where any given single mother has children by several different males and any given male has children by several different mothers. If that is the norm, there is no incentive for young boys to stay in school, get a job, uh, you know, start out at a, at a low wage job and work, work their way up. And, and so you have a situation where males simply are not civilized and that's what's driving these utterly insane drive-by shootings that we saw Father's Day, 106 people shot in, in uh, Chicago, including a three-year-old boy who was fatally shot mirroring the Father's Day shooting spree in Chicago in 2016 when another three-year-old boy was shot, this time paralyzed for life. 
Uh, that's that's what's behind all of this. And Obama, in when he was running for president the first time in 2008, gave a very powerful speech, at least the first half of yeah, it in did. Chicago, yeah. mm-hmm. talking about these statistics. Mm-hmm. And then he, of course, swiveled to, oh, well, we need more government services. Mm-hmm. But at that moment, he had the courage to speak the truth. He did. In fact, in that same op-ed, he um, Travis Yates uh, quoted him on that. So. Oh my gosh! Yeah, Chicago sp- especially is 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 leading on this front, right? That's just a mess over there. Well, actually, Chicago gets more attention because it's a big city, but there's other cities with much higher oh. per capita homicide rates, like St. Louis and Baltimore, but they're not as sexy. <laughs> Since I live in St. Louis, I can vouch for that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. Well, I really appreciate your time, Heather. Thank you. Um, if anybody wants to get this information, um, she, uh, Heather not only is the author of The War on Cops, which I mentioned earlier, but also wrote a great piece called The Myth of Systemic Police Racism. So if you type it into Google, it'll pull right up and you'll get awesome facts in there, everything you need to know for the argument against what is um, what we're being fed every day. So I appreciate your coming on, Heather. Thank you, Suzanne. I appreciate it. Take care. When you got married, things were perfect. You were both in love and life was good. Then somewhere along the line, everything changed. She changed, or maybe he did. Either which way, now your relationship feels, well, hard. I coach husbands and wives who feel lonely, disrespected, or misunderstood in their relationship. So many women today are desperate for their husbands to step up to the plate, to make a decision and to stick to it, to lead rather than to follow. Ladies, you have the power to make it happen. Men respond best to women who are grounded in their feminine core. As for husbands, so many of them want their wives to stop nagging and to just trust them, to smile more and to complain less, to look at them the way they did when they were first dating. Men, you have the power to make it happen. Women respond best to men who are grounded in their masculine core. The secret to lasting love rests in the masculine-feminine dance. Once you master it, your relationship will no longer be difficult. You'll be moving with the biological tide rather than against it. And that makes marriage smooth sailing. If you're struggling in your relationship, if you feel frustrated or alone, I can help. Just go to SuzanneBanker.com, that's S-U-Z-A-N-N-E-V-E-N-K-E-R.com, and click on the coaching button at the top. Don't wait another minute to acquire the mindset you need to find love and to sustain it. It's so much easier than you think. That's SuzanneVenker.com. That ends this hour of The Suzanne Venker Show. Don't forget to tune in next week when Andre Parody joins me to take questions from our listeners. And don't forget to continue the conversation on Facebook. Just type in The Suzanne Venker Show in the Facebook search bar and you will find it. Also, please recommend this podcast to one friend you think would enjoy it. And don't forget to leave us a review on whatever platform you're now using. Finally, if you have a question or comment for me, you can email me at Suzanne at the Suzanne Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great week.